Uh, welcome everyone to today's Tech Talk. Um, I'd like to mention that we are going to be external, so please hold any confidential uh, questions, not that there would be any for this talk, possibly, but uh, till the end. We're very pleased today to have with us uh, Professor Shimon Shakin. Uh, uh, Shimon is a professor of information technologies and founding dean of Efi Arazi School of Computer Science in Herzliya, Israel. That's near Tel Aviv. Previously, Shimon was at NYU and IDC in Israel. Today's talk will describe a new approach and a new course that aims to demystify the integrated function of computer systems using a hands-on approach. Please join me in welcoming Shimon Shakin. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, a company like uh, Google has to contend with many different disciplines in computer science, whether it's distributed processing or database management, operating systems, grid computing, GUI, um, graph theory, and so on. But at the end, all these different topics gel into one grand theme, search. I guess I'm talking about the core business of Google. And this, in a nutshell, is one of the biggest differences between academic programs and, and real life. In, in real life, most of the interesting problems and opportunities that we see present themselves as multidisciplinary themes, and it's kind of difficult to draw lines and, 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 and show where the algorithm ends and the implementation starts, or where, where is database management, where is object-oriented programming. Everything, everything is kind of uh, gelled together. And yet, academic programs are structured around topics. They have to be structured around, around topics, and each topic is covered by a standalone course taught by typically a different professor and accompanied by a thousand page uh, textbook. And as a result of that, students are becoming increasingly more and more specialized in niche uh, pockets and, and, and areas in computer science. And, and increasingly, they miss the forest for the trees. They, uh, they fail to appreciate all the uh, interfaces and, and contracts that lurk in the background and create the very fabric that, that, uh, that, that makes what applied computer science is, is all about. So uh, that's where this talk enters the picture. Uh, Noam Nissan and myself, both of us were program directors at uh, uh, two different universities, and we felt that computer science programs should have also, in addition to the core courses and so on, they should have some theme-oriented courses. And the grandest theme of all that we could think of was building a computer system, a general purpose computer, hardware and software from scratch. And uh, this ended up indeed being, being a very uh, stimulating and, and empowering activity for the students because it's an act of creation, of creating something from nothing. So what I'm going to do in the next hour is fast forward through this course, which is actually an approach to teaching applied computer science, and try to convince you that it can be done. Uh, in fact, uh, and it can be done in one semester. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm, and I'm not talking about half-baked ideas. I'm talking about uh, uh, a course and, uh, that has been uh, published. I mean, the, the, a book came out about a year and a half ago by MIT Press that accompanies this book, this uh, course. And uh, the course has been taught in several different universities. And I think by now, more than 1,000 students have taken it and uh, have been quite uh, happy campers. So, so the course works, and, uh, uh, and here's what we do. We basically, we start the course by telling the students that, that God gave us uh, NAND, and, uh, and if you want, you can throw in also uh, a constant. And, uh, and then God said, now go build a computer, and when, when men asked how, uh, God answered one step at a time. And in fact, this is a very important element in our course. The, uh, the students are going to be engaged in very complex, fantastically complex engineering projects, both hardware and software. Uh, but we uh, have laid out all the designs of these projects, and we did it in a very sort of stepwise fashion. And, and, and modularity uh, is, is a key virtue in this course and something that is an important part of the education that the students uh, gain from the course. So this is the um, explicit. Uh, uh, goal of the course, you know, let's start from nothing and end up with a computer. The computer that we will build, as you will soon see, has uh, the touch and feel of, of a simple uh, PDA. 
And you can write all sorts of pro It's a general purpose computer. You can write all sorts of programs for it. But the implicit uh, agenda is to understand the key hardware and software abstractions and interfaces that make, make the field. And also to appreciate the history and, and method of computer science, uh, which is kind of gained uh, as, you, as you go along in, in the lectures of this course. It, it's, a, it's a lot of fun uh, taking this course and building the computer, and the students do it with a great deal of motivation. Uh, the methodology of this course is very strict, um, because otherwise there's no way that you can finish it once, in one semester. So first of all, it's constructive. We don't talk much. We, we build a lot of stuff. Uh, the lectures are not very important, but uh, uh, they're kind of a nice uh, add-on to the projects. I mean, there's a set of projects, uh, weekly projects, in which you, you build uh, gradually the whole, the whole thing. Uh, the course is self-contained. The only thing that you need in order to take it is programming, which is surprising. I mean, you don't have to know anything about architecture, virtual machines, or, or whatnot. It's, uh, uh, all the knowledge that, that you need to know in the course is, is self-contained in, in the textbook and the course. Uh, all the plans for building the computer uh, uh, architecture and the software hierarchy are given uh, in the form of APIs in our website. And the course is also extremely focused. We don't deal with anything which is unnecessary for the purpose of building this computer. We just want to build a computer that can, with which you can play Tetris or Space Invaders and kind of stay alive. You know, we don't want to make it too fancy, because otherwise there's no way that we'll, we'll be able to do it in one semester. So, um, so this, is, this is what the students see. But actually, behind the scene, what they get is the whole uh, a slew of, of, of different things. And what you see here are those topics that I talked about before, which are covered in many different courses in the program. But here, finally, they converge together. Okay, so we have topics from very different areas in computer science, but all of them come to play uh, um, very vividly in the context of, of building this computer. <clears throat> here are some screenshots of uh, the computer when it's finally uh, uh, running. So these are programs that the students wrote for the computers that they built. As you will see in a minute, the computer has a screen and a keyboard interface. So this is a simple data processing program. Uh, here's a Pong uh, uh, screenshot, Space Invaders. I will demo some of these uh, in a few minutes. Hangman, and so on. So the course map is as follows. We have two grand uh, pieces, hardware and software. And um, the interface that sort of links them together is obviously the machine language uh, that, that puts this whole structure together. And um, what you see here are th those Ps are, they stand for, you can call it instructional unit. An instructional unit is a lecture, a project, and a chapter in the book. So if you just go through these units uh, week by week, uh, you end up building the machine. So we start with some, um, we build something like 10 or 12, I forgot, elementary logic gates, and or XOR, and so on. Then we put them together, and we build a, uh, a little uh, ALU and CPU. And then we build a memory system. Uh, then we jump up to P4, where we introduce the machine language. We write some programs for the machine language. Having learned the machine language, we step back and build the hardware architecture that realizes this language using uh, the various uh, chipset that, uh, that we built below. And then in the uh, second part of the course, we build uh, an assembler, uh, a VM, and a compiler for um, a very simple Java-like language that we have uh, formulated. And, uh, and then we use the same language to also write a little operating system. Uh, for this uh, machine. And finally, we write some, some games like Tetris and, uh, and Snake and uh, so on for this uh, computer. Uh, so the Ps are these instructional units. Each unit is self-contained, and it's extremely self-contained in the sense that you can actually teach this course in any order that you wish, which sounds a little bit crazy. But if you want, I mean, you can start here. You can start with a VM, because the interface below is very well defined. And, Every one of these boxes here is an abstraction that is implemented using the services of the abstraction below it. And, and these interfaces are well defined in the course, so you don't really have to teach or do the hardware. You can do just the software or the other way around. So what I'll do next is I'll walk you through a typical project. So uh, what we see here are five different projects. And uh, 
the tools that we use in order to build all these things is, first of all, a very simple dialect of HDL that you can learn in one hour, and uh, a test description language that we uh, designed for the purpose of this uh, project, for this course, and also a hardware simulator which we built and can be downloaded freely from our website. All the software that we developed for this course, and there's a lot of software that accompanies it, is uh, open source, can run on both uh, Windows and Unix, and available from our website. So these are the tools that we use. And uh, let's take, for example, some elementary logic gates. And um, in the first project, what you do is, well, NAND is God-given. So we start with that. And using this, we build a NOT. And using NOT, we build a TRUE. And then um, we build AND and uh, OR. And obviously, every gate here is designed using uh, the gates that have been designed previously. And then we build the MUX and, uh, and so on, about 12 gates altogether. Okay? So let's focus on, on one of these gates, let's say end, and actually build it. So um, we tell the students that here is, here is end. End is a black box. Here's the gate diagram of end and the, um, the truth table of this operation. And we also give them an HDL program stub. And the stub consists of the uh, input and the output of the gate. You know, that's the API of the gate and uh, a comment. And finally, we give them a test script. And the test script is written in our testing language. Uh, this is something that you load into the uh, hardware simulator. And essentially what it says, it tells the simulator, look for a file called endHDL, this one, load it into the simulator, then create an output file called endout. Uh, let's ignore the compare to for a minute. And then whenever you see the word output, I want you to output the current values of A, B, and out. And then starts the actual simulation. Okay, so we have four steps here. Set A to zero, set B to zero, eval, evaluate the logic of the gate, and output something out. Well, what you output is this, A, B, and out, and so on. And you just walk the simulators through all the possibilities of this very simple gate. And um, the contract is that when you run, well, you have to write the HDL that will make this test work and, and generate, uh, generate this, the compare file up there. So. Um, the compare file, or the truth table in this case, is also given to the students as a text file. So when you run your HDL, your modified HDL on our TST, your output should be the same as our compare file. That's the deal. Okay? So uh, the student goes home, and um, here's, he starts, he or she, they start with something like that. And uh, at some point, they figure out the gate logic uh, uh, up there. And then they simply um, uh, implement it in some you know, back of the envelope drawing or something like that. Uh, in fact, the simulator, uh, um, but, but in the next version of the simulator, you can also draw these gates um, graphically and have them and, and, and produce the HDL from it automatically. But basically, what, what the student does, they, they draw this picture and then they, uh, they render it in, in, uh, in a textual form in HDL. Uh, so basically, we need two gates, NAND and NOT, NAND and NOT. And here are the connections, and uh, the NAND uh, outputs uh, it's the output into, uh, pipes it into X, and then the NOT uh, uh, has the X feed uh, its end gate and uh, out going to out, and you know, that's it. That's, that's how this gate is implemented. So here's an example of how it's being done in the hardware uh, simulator. Uh, that we provide. So what we see here, well, that's a different gate. It's, um, it's a XOR gate, okay? So here's the diagram. Here is um, the HDL program that the student has written or, or the program that was generated from the diagram. And here's the test script with a lot of white space added to make it more readable. Um, and what you see here are the various uh, steps in the, uh, in the test script. Some, some, te some steps end with a, with a comma, some with a semicolon. The comma is kind of a micro step, and the, and the semicolon is a big step. So that whenever you click um, this control here up here, it executes um, all the commands in the test script uh, up to the next uh, semicolon. Uh, so that's what we do here. We, uh, we walk the simulator. I mean, this is PowerPoint. In a minute, you will see it for real. But we walk it through the various steps, and uh, at some point, we say, well, show me what, what came out from the simulation. 
Well, here's the output file. If you look at the output file, it seems like it has the correct functionality of XOR, so you're happy. You can also compare it to the compare file and make sure that, that uh, your chip works. So that's the first project in which we build 12 such chips. That's week one. And uh, here's another example of, uh, of a chip, a 16-bit adder. The computer, by the way, is 16-bit. So here is um, the implementation of a 16-bit adder using uh, full adders. If you uh, focus on one of, the, one of them, well, here's the full adder chip consisting of three half adders. Half adder consists of uh, XOR and an AND. Uh, XOR consists of, well, here's a better implementation of XOR than the one you saw earlier. Uh, if you click uh, AND, you get uh, what we saw before, not NAND. And if you click NOT, uh, actually, this is what we, no, if you click NOT, we get uh, the NOT implementation from NAND. If you click NAND, well, the buck stops here, and NAND is primitive and God-given, uh, so it's implemented in Java. Okay? The, uh, the simulator is implemented in Java, and it has a whole suite of, um, of primitive Java-based implementations of, of chips. So if there's no HDL program, uh, the simulator resorts to, uh, uh, to one of its uh, uh, chip files, so, so to speak, the, non dot, uh, the chip.java files that provide the functionality of this chip. Uh, we mentioned history, so you know, that's, that's an example of, of a great place where you can talk, you, you can talk about you know, people like George Bull and Claude Shannon and discuss how great ideas, which were quite abstract uh, 150 years ago, became extremely practical uh, when uh, electrical engineering uh, started and all of a sudden, you know, Shannon discovered that he could use the algebra of, of Boolean algebra in order to describe the behavior of, of logic gates. So these great connections that sort of overarch uh, different periods in history, they, they come to life. They can come to life in a course like that. And that's, in my lectures, that's what I do. I spend half of every lecture talking about the historical context of these things. Because other than that, you don't have to talk much because everything is, is in the project. The students go home and they just do the project. Um, and, and they get most of their educational value from the projects, not from the lectures. Well, here's, here's another anatomy of, of a RAM chip. I don't have time to go through it. But basically, it's kind of a top-down uh, recursion, if you will. And uh, just a few comments about the simulator. Um, as we said, NAND is primitive. But in general, uh, this computer is made up of about 30 different chips. And at some point, we had a, an insight that what we should do, perhaps, is implement all these chips in Java and put them in the simulator also. So that if, if, um, if, you start, if the simulator starts to evaluate the logic of a chip, it finds some chip, chip part. It looks for, the, for an HDL uh, file that provides the functionality of this chip, chip part. Failing to find this file, it looks for a Java file that implements this chip file, uh, this chip behavior, and then it uses it. Now, this means that because everything is, was, was predefined in Java, you don't have to build all the chips in order to build any one uh, of the higher level chips. So if you want to build, let's say, a RAM, you can just um, use the register, DMOOCs, and MOOCs, and you have a RAM, uh, RAM chip working because if you didn't write those lower level, uh, the, uh, the register, DMOOCs, and, and MOOCs, uh, the, the simulator will use the Java classes instead. So this gave, gave us tremendous freedom. You don't have to write everything. You can uh, uh, develop those chips in any order that you wish. Or if the student gets stuck in something, if for some reason the student cannot implement a MOOCs or a DMOOCs, that's OK. They can still uh, complete the definition of the chip and simulate it and test it and maybe get partial credit for the project. Uh, but, but they, you know, the, uh, local catastrophes are, are never, never global. That this, this is the meaning of this uh, strategy here. Um, and you also get behavioral simulation of the chip and uh, all sorts of other things that, that I don't have to discuss. I don't have time to discuss, so we'll, we'll skip it maybe for questions at the end if we'll have time. All right, so this is uh, elementary logic gates. And uh, moving along, we build an ALU. Uh, the ALU consists of well, we saw it, half adder, full adder, and adder. And then we use the adder to, to build a full-blown ALU. And the ALU has two 16-bit um, inputs and six control bits that, that instruct the ALU what to do. And also, it emits two, uh, two bits um, uh, that, that are used by the control unit of the computer later on. So uh, we have six control bits. 
And um, altogether, given these uh, six control bits, um, we, the LU is designed to compute all these uh, nice functions. Um, and what you have here is pretty good functionality for an assembly language um, without multiplication. We implement multiplication in software, as you will see in a minute. Um, so let's focus on the control bits. Um, here are these six control bits. And um, they have those funny names because uh, they imply on, on what they do. So ZX means um, ignore the X input, just make it 0. And NX means convert the X input. Remember, X and Y are 16-bit. Z ZY and NY do the same for Y. Then if, if F is 1, compute X plus Y, else compute X and Y. And if NO, NO is 1, convert the, the out, otherwise leave it alone. It turns out that given this, uh, uh, given this uh, setting here, with different combinations of, of bits, um, of asserting these uh, six control bits, you get all the functionality on the right. Okay, so you can, you can compute 0, 1, minus 1, x, y, not x, not y, and so on and so forth. In fact, we have six control bits, so actually we can implement 64 functions, but most of them are, are undocumented features of this ALU. Okay, so we, uh, we described only these functions. If you're a real hacker, you can, you can discover some other very nice functions that this, this ALU can, can compute. This is, I really like this ALU. I mean, this is a, it's, it's a logical ALU. You know, developing it is, is a piece of cake because in order to develop it, all you have to do is implement the behavior that you see up there. You have to either zero the input or negate it. That's it. That's all you have to do. And then all the rest of the, of the functionality of the ALU is determined by this very clever table that Noam Nissan, uh, my colleague, uh, figured out. So um, the LU is really a, a piece of cake to, uh, to develop. And once you, you have it, uh, it's a small step to develop a full-blown CPU. Here we see how the LU fits in the big picture. We see the six control bits. We now call them Cs, C1 to C6. And um, we have this table that we saw before, but we add one more uh, detail. One of the inputs of the LU can come either from an A register or from the RAM, so we have a multiplexer there controlled by a seventh uh, control bit, the A. And finally, you have, so you have all these functionality. A is, is the A register. It's an address register that can act also as a data register. D is a strictly a data register. M is the currently selected register in the RAM. Okay, so you have all these mnemonics available to you when, when, when you get to write the, um, the assembly language. All right, then we go on and we build a memory system. Um, we start with DF, uh, uh, data flip-flops, and we, uh, we, we build a, a bit um, um, storage unit. Then we put a bunch of bits together, 16 bits together. We get a register. We do it in HDL, obviously. Then we use a multiplexer and demultiplexer to build a RAM 8. Uh, I don't show you all the details because we don't have time. We, put, we stack eight of these together, we get the RAM uh, 64. Two, three more steps, you get uh, RAM 32K, which is what we need for, for our computer. Okay, so it's not a very efficient implementation, but it works. Um, then we, uh, we play with the machine language. So the machine language is something that we invented, and uh, we have two commands only in the machine language. The first one is called A instruction. And we use it to set the A register to a certain 15-bit value. Uh, so um, in binary, uh, this is the instruction. Uh, the opcode is 0. And then you have a 15-bit constant, which uh, the architecture uses in order to set. Um, uh, so th this is the constant that goes into the A register. And then we have a C instruction, uh, which is the major sort of working horse of this language. And the, langu the syntax of the C instruction is kind of high level. Uh, destination equals some computation with an optional jump, okay? So uh, computation is one of these mnemonics that you saw before. So we can tell the LU compute D or D plus 1 or M minus 1 and so on. And then uh, destination can be any of these combinations. So the output of the LU actually is wired simultaneously into the D, into the A, and into the RAM. And using different control bits, we can open different subsets of these three containers 
to accept the output of the ALU. So these are the various outputs of the ALU. And, um, and here are the jump possibilities. We have eight of them, which is all we need, all the possible jump conditions. And the jump is always conditioned, not always, but uh, it's conditioned on the output of the ALU. So this, is, this means jump if the output was greater than zero, jump if the output was equal, equal zero, and so on. We're missing two control bits that go down here, which provide the, uh, the results. Well, well they, are, they are one if the ALU is positive or zero. And, um, and that's how we implement uh, the materialized uh, jumps, uh, so to speak. So that's the C instruction. And uh, the binary mapping of the C instruction is the following. The opcode is one. Then we have two unused bits, which we set to one by default, by convention. And then we have the seven control bits of the ALU, which make up the comp field, the three control bits of the destination, the three control bits of, of the jump. And here are the values of, of these uh, things. And that's what you need when you, when you write the assembler for this machine. You, you're going to see programs written in the syntax at the top. And in order to run these programs, you have to first translate them into their binary equivalents. And you do it using uh, basically these two pages, is all, these two slides is all you need in order to implement the assembler. Well, a little bit more than that, because you also need a symbol table, which I haven't discussed. So that's the machine language. And uh, finally, we put all these things together, and we get a computer. Actually, we start with the CPU. Um, everything here is standard. We did it already. We, we, we did the ALU. Uh, we uh, developed the registers when we, when we uh, built the, uh, the memory uh, system. Uh, the multiplexers are from project one. So you just put them together. So essentially, an instruction comes in, 16-bit instruction. Using HDL, you split it into various fields, and you, you sort of you just, you just pipe these fields into different locations of the computer. So some of these bits are control bits that open up different, uh, different registers. Other bits uh, feed the ALU and tell the ALU what to do. Uh, other fields control the jump or, or the PC, the program counter uh, logic, and so on. So you know, writing this uh, CPU is a matter of it's one page of HDL. Here it is. Okay, this is the, uh, uh, the HDL, one HDL implementation of, of the ALU. Looks a little bit forbidding, but uh, it, it's really quite simple. Um, finally, you take the CPU, um, and you take the two memory systems that, uh, that we built earlier. I forgot to say, this, this computer, it's a von Neumann machine, but it's also called, I think, a Harvard uh, architecture in which the, um, uh, the instruction memory and the, data, and the data memory are separate two separate units because it's, a it's the simplest architecture to build. So um, you put all this thing together, and uh, you get a computer that realizes the machine language that we described before. So the HDL of this um, uh, architecture is uh, just three lines of code. Okay, That's project five. In project five, you build the CPU and, uh, and the computer. Um, in fact, one, you know, one goal that I, that I have in life is, is trying to fit everything on one page or one slide. And, and I, I, we managed to do it in this course. All the, pro, all the HDL programs are no longer than one page of code. In some cases, just a few lines of code. Uh, if, if, you, if you can get to do it, it means that you, you design something which is well designed because it's modular. Um, now, this is just one computer model. You know, one can build many other computer models, dedicated computers that do only one thing and what not. So different instructors can come up with different ideas. And, and different students can come up with different ideas. And um, so here, I guess we'll talk about von Neumann and who made this thing uh, possible and, and Turing, although we talk about Turing later on in the course. And uh, we'll probably talk about Andy Grove and other people who made it fast and explain you know, what to do in order to make it fast, which is something which we don't, we don't, we don't really discuss in the course too much. In fact. We are very careful uh, not to give the impression to the students that this is, you know, that, that this is the holy grail. That this, we, in fact, in every lecture, every chapter in the book, we end up with a section that talks about all the things that we didn't cover, all the things that have to be covered, all the things that, that make it efficient. And um, in fact, most of the interesting stuff in computer science is, is making these things work efficiently and, and quickly and smoothly. So all these things are you know, beyond the scope of this course, but at least the students understand where they, you know, why they are important and, and how they hook to, uh, 
to, uh, to the core material in, in computer science. Okay, we haven't talked about input and output, so here is how they enter the picture. Uh, our memory uh, space has um, a screen memory map which hooks to, um, to a window on the PC screen, and it also has a keyboard memory map which is just a single word in memory, 16-bit, which captures the, uh, the Unicode of, of the key which is currently pressed. Um, I, can, I can demo some of these things. Uh, so here is my, here's my, our CPU. Well, this is a CPU emulator. Basically, it's a computer emulator. It's not the hardware simulator. It's an emulator of this specific computer that has two separate memory spaces. And I can load the program into it written in machine language. So let's do this one. Uh, okay, this program, uh, here's, here's the code. Uh, I'm going to input something here in RAM 0. This program is designed to draw uh, a rectangle on the, on the upper left uh, corner of the screen. The width of, of the rectangle is going to be 16 bits, 16 pixels, and the depth is the contents of, of RAM 0, which now happens to be 50. So I can sort of step through the program and uh, you see the lines starting piling up. Let's do it quickly. Uh, so you see it actually going through a loop and drawing this uh, rectangle up here. Now, if you were a hacker, I guess one thing which would be quite interesting is this special address there, 16384. What, you know, what, where in the world this address comes from? So this is something which, which is worth uh, exploring. So the, the program ended. Well, we always end our programs with an infinite loop. Okay, so that's, that's how you see the program ended. And uh, if you want to explore what's going on, you can stop the simulation. Let's take a look at this address here, 16384. So I have this little uh, binocular here, and I can enter addresses here, 16384. And let's see what's, oh, and lo and behold, there's a minus one there, you know, in the middle of a desert of zeros. Well, minus one in binary is um, 16 ones, okay? So this is actually the screen image of, uh, this, these are the 16 pixels. That's what turns on 16 pixels that make up a row in this, uh, in this image. And uh, so it looks like, you know, this is the area, that's the low memory, that's the, th these are the 8K that control the screen. So if I go down, I don't know, somewhere here, and I pick up just a random address and, and write minus one here, you get this little line up there, okay? So if you, want, if you want to write graphics applications for this computer, low level, that's what you have to do. You have to actually go in, use assembly language, and, uh, and, and turn on and off the right uh, bits. And we have a couple of programs um, to, to get the students up to speed with this language. You know, we don't want them to learn this language, just to feel it. So a typical program would be something like um, uh, have the user click uh, any key on the keyboard, and when the user clicks something, blacken the screen, just make the screen black. And when he releases uh, uh, the key, make it white again, okay? Now how you make it black and white is up to you. You can either do it in spiral, which would be nice, or just do it in a silly way from left to right. Uh, so the students get, get quite creative with li these little programs. All right, so that's it. And uh, moving along, just to sum up uh, the hardware, um, that's the chipset that we built, around 30 different chips. And uh, if you put them all together, you get the, the computer up and running. Um, just to show you how a typical project looks like, um, here is, let's say, uh, project two. Uh, so that's the project where we build combinational chips uh, let's take a look at the ALU. So, you know, that's the ALU. Uh, here is the uh, HDL stub. Lots of documentation describing the ALU logic. That's what we give the students. Here's the API of the ALU, the six control bits, um, the two uh, bits that it emits, uh, the two inputs, uh, X and Y, X and Y, and this comment that the students uh, don't enjoy uh, seeing. That's what they have to fill in. And then in addition to this stub, we give them um, a test file, 
that they can you know, hook into the uh, simulator and it will test their, their, their LU design. And then we also give them a compare file which shows uh, the results that we want to see for every combination of, of bits and, and control bits and, and inputs. Not every, but for some of them. So, um, so once again, the projects are very um, well uh, documented and all the materials are there and um, you just have to go out and build it. All right, so uh, moving along, I'll spend about 10, 15 minutes about the software hierarchy and then we'll open up for questions. Uh, so uh, we've done with the hardware, um, and here's the software. So the first thing that we do is we write an assembler for the uh, assembly language that we uh, specified. And um, so essentially, you have to start with a program that looks like this. You know, this is a typical program in assembly. Uh, typically, you, you set the, the A register to some address, and then this address selects uh, a register in, in the uh, memory unit, and then take this register, add it to D, put it back into this register, and so on. Okay, that's the typical uh, programming style in this language. And we have labels. Um, you, you may be surprised, you know, why are the labels surrounded by parentheses and not, it might, would make more sense to just write label colon. Okay, well, it's always nice to, uh, when you compile something, it's always nice to know uh, where you're at after you read the first token in every line. So, when you write an assembler for this language, all you have to do is look at the first uh, character in every line. If, it, if it's a left paren, you know that you have a label. Um, so it's not maybe very uh, beautiful, but it's, it makes compilation easier. So essentially, you have to start in a program like this and end up with a binary program like that. You have to implement a symbol table, which we discuss in the course. And, uh, but beyond that, you just use the, uh, the binary maps that I showed earlier, and, and you have an assembler. Um, and here we will probably talk about Ada Lovelace and Babbage and people like that. And we also have a visual assembler that the students can play with and can, can download from our website. And then they have to build it. They don't have to build all this GUI, but they have to build an assembler that using a command line can convert an ASM file into a HEC file written in binary. The computer, by the way, is called HEC. Um, we talked about the CPU emulator. Uh, so that's the assembler, and moving along, we build a VM implementation. Well, before we build a VM implementation, we have to introduce a VM abstraction. And uh, we start off with this uh, uh, glorious uh, picture that actually, um, it, it describes, I think, the modern architecture of, or the architecture of a modern compiler, two-tier compiler, front-end, back-end. You know, the front-end compiles into some intermediate language, like uh, bytecode or uh, IL. And then you take this intermediate language and you compile it further, that's the back end, into whatever you want, you know, whatever platform you want to, uh, to use. Uh, and also, this, this, this slide is, is also a good picture of this whole course, because what you do is, in the first six projects, you build this platform here. And then the next, projects, next two projects, you build a VM implementation. Then we build a compiler. And finally, uh, we, uh, we build a little operating system which extends uh, the bare language, the, the Jack language that, that is high level. We'll, we'll talk about it later on. So, um, so what we do in the course is we do those red parts, at least in this project. We have a VM emulator that we give the students written in Java, a pretty fancy program that I will demo in a minute. And then they have to implement uh, our VM language themselves uh, into um, um, and into a, they have to implement it and write a program that translates from the VM code into hack uh, native code, machine language. So here we'll probably talk about Turing and universal uh, Turing machines and the concept of implementing you know, the logic of one machine on another, using one machine to emulate the code of another machine and, and doing all this on top of your personal computer and which runs on top of Windows or Unix or whatever it is, so it's a fantastic, you know, sequence of abstraction implementation, abstraction implementation, abstraction implementation. It's, and understanding it, I think, is a very deep insight in, in computer science. Um, so here's the VM language. It's a typical VM language, similar to Java's uh, bytecode. Uh, we have stack-based arithmetic commands. We have uh, pop and push. We have some program flow commands. And uh, the VM language also implements the uh, function abstraction, which um, 
So you can write a program that consists of many functions, uh, which will make the, the implementation of the compiler later, later on much easier because all the function calling uh, and returning logic is implemented at the VM level. Uh, so um, here's a program written in C, a program that multiplies two numbers. And here is the same program written in our VM language. In the middle is a pseudo code in which we uh, retain the names of the variables. On the right is the actual VM language that, that we use. We have a, a local segment, an uh, argument segment, local variables, argument variables, constants, and uh, uh, statics. And, uh, and here is the VM emulator. Um, which is a fairly, uh, uh, well, it's, it's, it looks, it looks uh, scary, but it's, actually it's not. Um, what we see here, we see a, here's a VM program. Here's a stack, working stack. The working stack is actually the tip of, um, of the global stack. So these two numbers, 15 and 8, are you know, these two numbers here. That's where the next number will go if you do a push. And all the numbers above here are frames of uh, functions that are waiting for the current function to stop execution. Um, and here we have our virtual memory segments where we hold uh, various families or, or types of, uh, actually kinds of variables in, in a typical object-oriented program. Um, so you know, this is where we hold uh, the current object data. Uh, this is the arguments of, of the current function, uh, the local variables, static variables of the class. Um, we haven't talked about these, these uh, abstractions yet because we didn't introduce the high-level language, but we don't really have to. Uh, we, we can write the VM implementation without even understanding the higher-level language. And it's good because you never know when you write a VM implementation, it, it should serve multiple languages. So you don't have to commit yourself to one language in particular. Um, well, some people asked us, uh, you know, where did we get the, um, the inspiration for this GUI? So it's from this picture here. Um, and um, in projects seven and eight, you have to implement the VM language over the hack platform. So basically, you have to write a translator that translates from the left to the right. It's, it's not a simple project. It's actually separated into two separate projects, uh, one deal, dealing with syntax and the other one with code generation. And, um, and that's how we, um, we implement the VM. Um, Next, we, um, we introduce our programming language, Jack. So here's, here's a little piece of code written in Jack. This is actually part of our operating system. We have a class called math that includes all sorts of useful functions. So here's a function that computes factorial. Here's a function that computes E. And uh, this is written in, in our own language, in Jack. And uh, in the next um, stage of, of the course, the students will write a compiler for this language. But actually, first they write a Jack program. And um, um, so I will demo one of these programs. And uh, so here's, here's the VM uh, emulator. So I'm going to load the program. Um, let's take one of these. I have some selected student projects here. We'll take Space Invaders. Um, so I loaded the Space Invaders program. The student wrote this program in Jack. And he used uh, all sorts of abstractions like you know, spaceship and uh, the gun that shoots the spaceship and game session and so on. And then the student translated it into, into the VM language. And once you translate it into VM, you can load it into the simulator and, and run it. And that's what I'll do now. So when you start running it, well, uh, wait. Uh, actually, I think I'd like to start running it. Uh, with, uh, yeah, you can, you can be fairly elaborate about the simulation. You can actually simulate uh, everything that kind of happens in the computer. And you, you can also see the, the data moving from one place to another, which can be useful. Right now, it's, it's a little bit too, too fast. I can stop it and do it stepwise. So you can see every step in isolation. Here you see a, you know, some stack-oriented uh, algebra going on. And um, so you can actually see everything running at any level of detail that you want. So this is pretty, pretty tedious, so I'll stop it here. And we'll just take a look at the, at the program flow without data moving around. So you see the program running. 
And in fact, you know, it takes something like 10,000 program, 10,000 commands to get executed before anything happens because you know this is a real computer. There's an operating system, which is also implemented in Jack and translated into, into the VM level. So it takes a lot of work just to get things done, just to get started. You know, the operating system has to set up all sorts of arrays and so on for its own internal computations. But it's kind of fun to see it, um, you know, um, working and. Um, so at some point, I will just stop this. I will cancel all the animation, no animation, and we'll just start running the program. Um, so here's the program in all its glory. And um, so I'm, I'm playing now, and uh, I'm getting killed. Uh, I'm not very good at that. Uh, so you know, I should tell you, well, I hope you appreciate the fact that you know, everything that you see here was implemented by the student, you know, uh, the graphics, the everything. So um, when we first built this machine, when we got to this level, this is like six years ago, the first program that we wrote was Square. And it was a square that you could move on the screen uh, by the four arrow keys, right, left, up, and down. That's all, all the th things that you could do. But when it started running, you know, I was so excited. So I sat there in my room, and I was moving this square around for two hours, right, left, up, down. And then my son, who was eight years old, he comes into my office and he, he looks at me sort of glued to the screen, looking at this stupid square. And he says, Dad, what are you doing? So I'm saying, leave me alone, I'm playing a computer game. And he looks at me, you know, and he says, these are the games that you play? Come to my room, I'll show you some games, you know. <laughs> Maybe he will. At some point, he will appreciate. Uh, so that's that's. Uh, so all we have to do really is write write the compiler and the the OS. The compiler project consists of two projects. Um, in the first project, we do syntax analysis. So we start with a Jack code, and uh, we translate. Actually, we, we parse the Jack code into XML. We found out that XML is a great way to describe uh, code. Uh, because the students know XML from other courses, and um, it, when you load this thing into, the, um, into any browser, um, the browser knows exactly what to do with it and renders it nicely. Um, so that's the, in the first project, we do this. Um, and uh, in the second project, we, we take this XML file as a point of departure. And then we, we walk you know, through this tree in depth first uh, traversal, and we generate code. So you know, we go all the way down, you find five, so you say push five, then you go here, push Y, then you go there, push X, then you, you go up here, and you do, well, you want to multiply, but multiply is not a primitive part of the VM language, so you have to call a function that multiplies, and then you push four, and so on and for, so forth. Okay, so it's a basically you know, the basic algorithm of generating code from, from, uh, from a past tree. Let me just uh, give you a brief uh, uh, overview of the project themselves. So here's compiler one, in which we do syntax analysis. Uh, so we give the students uh, some classes written in Jack, for example. Oh, that's the square game that I talked about before. So here's the main class of this uh, game. So you know, that's the Jack code. We give it to the students, and then we tell them, well, if you do it right, well, first of all, you have to tokenize it. So here's the same code uh, tokenized, OK? And we also throw in some labels that we give the students as directive. They have to use it in their code. The nice thing about writing in XML is that you know, the, if you use the browser, you can do things like that and then open it up. And then um, you, take this, um, you take this tokenized list and you write a parser on top of it, and then the result becomes this, written in XML. So he here's the same program, the main class written in XML, ready, to, ready for code generation. So once again, you can close it and you know, open whatever you want and uh, explore it, and also talk about you know, the, um, the, uh, the morphology of a program. So we have a class here, that's the name of the class, that's the left paren, end paren, here are the subroutine de declaration. You can open them up and, uh, and focus on you know, whatever you want. So once again, the projects are um, 
uh, have a lot of documentation and text and test uh, unit testing and many different steps um, that the students have to go through, and uh, and that's how they write the compiler. Uh, okay, before we go on, you know, I have only two or three more slides to go. I, I guess I should mention one thing. A lot of people who hear this talk uh, don't believe that you can do it in one semester because it looks like too much. And yet, um, I, was, I was a dean and a program director for 10 years uh, in Israel. And, um, and because I, I was a program director, students always came to complain to me about courses that were too hard and so on. And, and I always tried to figure out why, you know, when someone comes in and says, you know, this course is, is very hard. So I'm trying to understand why it is hard. In, you know, 90 cases out of 100, the course is hard because the homework was not well specified. You know, there was some word which was missing. There was some sentence which was uh, confusing. And therefore, the material is not always what's difficult. What's difficult is, is, is that someone, typically the instructor or whoever wrote the projects, which sometimes are not the instructor but the teaching assistant, in some cases doesn't know English or Hebrew very well, they end up you know, creating uh, chaos. And, um, and therefore, uh, it turns out that if you work very hard on, on building all the tools that you need and all the project materials, and the unit testing and the test programs and test scripts and so on. If you build all these tools, uh, the projects become you know, a pleasure to actually implement. So we spent five years building all these things and bringing them to, to a point where you can actually build a compiler in two weeks. Um, operating system. So when you look at the typical Jack program, of which we have an example here, well, a lot of stuff in this program is not primitive Jack. You know, things like keyboard, output, array, these are not part of the primitive language, so you have to implement some, them somehow. So basically, we implemented them in an operating system um, that has these uh, bunch of classes. Uh, and every one of these classes has an API. So here is, here's the math API. Actually, it's not everything, but some of the uh, functionality that we want the students to implement. And here is uh, a string API. Uh, for string processing, arrays, uh, output for uh, text uh, output, um, screen for um, graphics, um, memory for memory management. Um, so we also implement uh, algorithms for allocating memory, deallocating memory, uh, peak, poke, and so on. And um, you need them when you need these things when you write the compiler. For instance, when you do a new for an object, you have to allocate memory for the new object. So you use the services of, of the operating system for that. Uh, keyboard, and I think this is it. Well, we also have some miscellaneous uh, stuff. Um, and then, then we have to uh, actually build it. Or you don't have to build everything, but we end up building you know, two or three classes of this uh, operating system. Now, this stuff is, is quite similar to early, early versions of Unix, because um, Everything here is written in Jack, just like Unix was written in C. And basically, the way you implement it, actually, it's like reverse engineering uh, Unix. It's like Linux. Because what we do is we give the students the operating system implemented. And then we tell them, you have to take one class at a time and implement it using the services of the other classes. You can assume the other classes are implemented, and then use them to implement this uh, class. And then gradually, you, you build the whole thing. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's a nice software engineering uh, experience. Uh, so to recap what we did, uh, we started with uh, primitive uh, logic gates. And we ended up building a computer that can play. Uh, here's an example of Pong that I haven't demonstrated. Actually, a fancy version of Pong. So we begin with logic, and we build a chipset. And then on top of it, we build a computer architecture, machine language, assembly, VM high-level language, an operating system, and finally an application. Now, when you think about a game like Space Invaders or, or Pong uh, or Snake, typically it's something like 15 object-oriented uh, operations to implement it in, in a high-level language. Um, and then every one of these uh, uh, operations, when, well, it en ends up being something like 250 lines of Jack code. That's the typical size of a Jack application. And then when you compile it into VM, it's about one, one to four. You get about 1,000 lines of VM code. Then you throw in the operating system. And uh, uh, at some point, you get about 30,000 lines of hack code 
for this uh, little program. And, and you see all these steps very uh, vividly. And then every, every one of these lines is a 16-bit uh, word. So you get about half a million bits. Every one of these bits is implemented with four uh, 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 NAND gates. So you get two million uh, logic gates working together to create this uh, illusion of uh, a Pong game or something like that. And then at this level, I guess we have one god. Um, so uh, we tell the students uh, that God gave us uh, zero and end, and everything else was done by humans. And that's, that's what this course uh, seeks to illustrate. Um, maybe just one more slide. Well, first of all, the course is extremely focused. And that's uh, one reason why we managed to do it in one semester. Uh, in fact, when we built it, we decided to include only the topics that you need in order to build a computer. Turned out that uh, this, uh, this was a subset of some of the most beautiful uh, things in computer science uh, that students see in many other courses in the program. So focus helps. And also, um, uh, not dealing with unnecessary stuff also helps. So all these things are not covered in the course, but they are great uh, ideas for uh, further projects, you know, for more things to do. The final chapter in the book um, is called uh, More Fun to Go. And in the More Fun to Go chapter, what we do is we tell them, well, you know, you don't like to see um, uh, multiplication in, in software. Well, why don't you go and play with the architecture, with, with the hardware, and try to make the ALU also multiply. It's not a big deal to do it. But then if you do it, you have to also to, you have to add some functionality to the, to the assembly language. And, um, and then a few other things have to change uh, in the hierarchy. So that's a great exercise, OK? Or if you want to, uh, you know, if you want to, the, the biggest bang for the buck um, is to optimize the VM. If you look at the VM implementation, you know, many things have to, can be optimized. And, and all of a sudden, your program will run 100 times faster. So you, why don't you go out and do it? If you don't like our graphics, why don't you go out and implement your own sprites? So um, every one of these limitations is actually, you know, it's a trigger for innovation, for creativity. Uh, so once you're very, you know, when, when you put it on the table, um, it becomes something that you can fix. Um, and also, the course is extremely well managed. You know, all the DTIs, all the APIs are given, numerous test files and programs and unit testing and so on. OK, I'll skip uh, one more slide. I'll just put the URL and, uh, and open up for questions. <clears throat> yes? Uh, is it possible to build a screen in, in hardware, in HDL? Yes. In fact, in every semester, we have uh, one team of brave students who actually implement it in uh, FPGA. Uh, using, they take our HDL, translate it into uh, VHDL, and, and then they try to build it on, on FPGA, which, which is not, it's not a simple project, but it can be done. So one more question. So, so let's say you play Pong on your HDL simulator. You can do that, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, how many instructions per second can your simulated CPU do? How fast is the simulator? Well, I don't remember the numbers, but it's fast enough to see the things moving on the screen quite uh, smoothly. OK, thank you. Yeah, this was actually our goal. Yeah. Uh, what age group were the students in this case? And Say it again? Uh, what age group were the students in this case? And about how young do you think this could be taught? Because, I mean, I'm seeing it's pitched at a sort of a you know, university sophomore level, but is this something you could introduce in high school? Yeah, I'm not sure that I understood all, uh, all the words in your question, but essentially um, this course can be, can be treated... It's a very flexible course. You can either use it as a capstone course that comes at the end of the program, at the senior level, or you can use it as a, as a course that can be taught immediately after programming. And in fact, you know, I taught this course at Harvard last year. They called it CS101. And they had a CS100, uh, I think, which was programming. And then uh, students uh, went directly into this course. It was an elective course. But they did it without uh, doing any other course uh, in the program. Now, ha having done this course, it's a lot of fun to take an architecture course or compilers course where you actually do you know, all the nasty stuff that we hid, you know, under the table. OK. 
Okay. Uh, I think the previous question actually hit on some of this, but I was actually I'm, I'm, thinking... I'm half deaf, so you have to raise uh, your I was actually thinking younger than high school. I was thinking, you know, 10 to 12 years old, right after you've had your first, you know, class in Logo or whatever they're teaching at that age. I agree completely. This kind of thing. Yeah, in fact, in Israel, they teach it in some high schools. And um, we, we had, I had a chat with uh, Jeff before the talk, Jeff Waltz, and um, he mentioned that this course is sort of... You know, it's like going back to basics. If you remember how computers looked like 10, 15 years ago, they were you know, in a level where you could actually dig in and, and, and figure out everything. And that's, that's what we try to do here. We try to, to create an artifact which is completely open for exploration. So in fact, it's very, I think, uh, lends itself very nicely to the mind of a young person who wants to explore. OK? All right, thank okay. you very much. Thank you, Shimon. Thank you.